Hello and welcome to this revision session for AQA A-Level Physics Paper 2 on the topic of gravitational fields. So in today's lesson we're going to be looking at how to answer examination questions for AQA A-Level Physics Paper 2, in particular gravitational fields. So if we've been successful and we've learned in today's lesson, we should be able to answer A-Level Physics examination style questions for gravitational fields, assess or understand non-A-Level Physics gravitational fields, and then finally understand what topics we need to improve upon for AQA A-Level Physics Paper 2, in particular gravitational fields. So how should you prepare for this revision session? Well, when you complete your work in this revision session, divide your piece of paper into two sections. Make the section on the left-hand side larger than the right-hand side. In this left-hand side section, write down your work and out and your answers to the questions in this revision session. When you're doing this, try to make sure you're writing full sentences and show your full working out. Whilst on the right-hand side, write down any pieces of information which you find useful or any hints and tips on answering questions from this revision session. At the end of the revision session, write up these notes into a revision sheet for you to use independently. Now in terms of revising AQA A-level physics, what should you be doing? Well the first step is learning the key facts, so use your revision guide, class workbook, student prep notes and the textbooks to learn the key ideas of the course, which might include writing mind maps or notes for yourself. The second step is to do retrieval, so test yourselves, so use things like Caboodle, Seneca, knowledge checkers to quickly test your own knowledge and you may wish to do this using your own cue cards. Then finally, uh, you can do practice by practicing examination style questions. So use things like exam practice books, homework books, supervised study books, additional workbooks to answer exam questions and mark your own work. And you may wish to download your own exam past papers to do this. So the three steps of learn the key facts, then testing yourself and then practicing your examination questions are how you should be revising for your A-level physics. Now in this revision session, you'll find we have three types of questions. The first question is a general check question. So these are the basic questions designed to probe your understanding of the key concepts of the topic. The second type of question are the, are the checkpoint questions, which are more challenging questions designed to place your knowledge and your understanding of the topics into different contexts and applications. Whilst the third type of question are the assessment point questions. So these are past paper examination questions which will mimic the type of questions which are found in public examinations. So let's now start having a look at the gravitational fields topic. So the first question says, describe what happens to the gravitational force between two objects A and B when the mass of A doubles, then the mass of both A and B double, then the distance between A and B halves, and then finally the mass of B doubles and the distance between A and B decrease by a factor of four. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so this is a test of the Newton's law of gravitation, where F equals G M M over R squared. So this tells us that F is directly proportional to M, so therefore the relationship would hold that if M doubles, F doubles. Now we know again from Newton's law of gravitation that F is directly proportional to M M, where they're two, they're both the masses of the two objects. So if big M and small M double, well therefore both will double, so therefore be times by a factor of four, so F will quadruple. We also know from the law of gravitation that f is directly proportional to 1 over r squared. So of r halves, f will therefore quadruple because it's it's half squared, so it's a quarter, then a 1 over a quarter is a times by 4, which is a quadrupling. Now if we link them all together, that f is directly proportional to m, and f is directly proportional to 1 over r squared, well when m doubles, f doubles, and if r decreases by a factor of 4, f increases by a factor of 16, so that therefore means f F will increase by a factor of 32. The next question says, calculate the gravitational force between two protons uh, of mass uh, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 are separated by a distance of 1 times 10 to the minus 14 meters. Two students of mass 65 kilograms and 70 kilograms stand in 1.5 meters apart. And then Saturn and the Sun, where you've got the mass of Saturn there, the mass of the Sun there, and their average separation in kilometers. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. 
Right, so again, this is using Newton's law of gravitation, where F is equal to G M M over R squared. So in this first one, you pop in all the values. Now again, remember it's R squared, and then you get out your answer to be 1.9 times 10 to the minus 36 Newtons. Again, you pop in these values, F equals G M M over R squared. Again, remember to square R. So we get 1.3 times 10 to the minus 7 Newtons. And then here in this question, remember that you're given the separation in kilometers and we work in meters in a level physics for this particular equation so you've got to convert million kilometers into meters so it's 1400 times by 10 to the 9 so therefore the answer is 3.8 times 10 to the 22 newtons the next question says, state the effect on the gravitational field strength at a point in a radial field around a point mass when firstly, the mass of the point mass is created in the field is halved, the distance from the point mass increases by a factor of three, and then the mass of the point mass decreases by a factor of four and the distance from the point mass halves. Then explain why when moving an object from a height of 100 meters to a height of 200 meters above the surface of the earth, the gravitational field strength does not decrease by a factor of four. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so again we're looking at our equation for gravitational field strength. So gravitational field strength is equal to g m over r squared. So therefore g is directly proportional to m, so if m halves, g will half. G is then for proportional to 1 over R squared. So if R increases by a factor of 3, G will decrease by a factor of 9 because it's 3 squared. And then we link the two ideas together. So if G is directly proportional to M, if M decreases by a factor of 4, G will decrease by a factor of 4. And G is what proportional to 1 over R squared. So if R decreases by a factor of 2, G will increase by a factor of 4, 2 squared. So the two things will cancel out. So there'll be no overall change in the gravitational force field strength. Now we do know that g is directly proportional to 1 over r squared, but it's a very important idea to remember that r is measured from the center of mass of the object, not the surface of the object. So in fact moving from 100 meters above the surface to 200 meters above the surface does not double r because it's not being taken from the center, so that's why it doesn't decrease by a factor of 4. The next question says, the sun has a mass of 1.99 times 10 to the 30 kilograms and a diameter of 1.39 million kilometers. Calculate the gravitational field at its surface. Then calculate the gravitational field strength 1.2 times 10 to the 8 meters from a point mass of 2.6 times 10 to the 23 kilograms. Then Mars has a mass of 6.42 times 10 to the 23 kilograms and a surface gravitational field strength of 3.72 newtons per kilogram. Calculate the radius of Mars, then the surface gravitational field strength of Venus is 8.77 newtons per kilogram, and it has a radius of 6.09 megameters. Uh, calculate the, ma the mass of Venus. So pause the uh, video now, and then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so this is using the gravitational field strength equation where G equals big G big M over R squared. So you pop in all the values there, remembering we're going to square R, and second remember it's million kilometers, so we've got to convert that into meters, so that'll be 10 to the 6. So therefore you would work it through, okay, to be, um, sorry, on that, and work it through there to be 679 newtons per kilogram. Now notice, by the way, we've been given the diameter, so we're going to have to half that to work out what the radius is. The next Next question again we're doing g big g m over r squared pop in all the values work it through remember it's r squared so you get 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 newtons per kilogram this next one we're going to rearrange it to make r the radius of the subject so r is going to be equal to the square root of g m over small g so therefore you pop in all the values work it through and get 3.4 times 10 to the 6 meters and then the next one we're going to make an m the subject so m is equal to a gravitational field strength times by r squared over the gravitational constant pop in all the numbers remember it's r squared and remember we we're given the radius in megameters so mega is times 10 to the 6 so we get 4.88 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. 
The next question says, determine the gravitational potential at firstly the Earth's surface, then secondly at a height of 650 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Then a small space probe of mass 510 kilograms has been landed on the surface of a small asteroid. Determine the output energy of the probe's onboard rockets for the probe to escape the gravitational field of the asteroid, given that the gravitational potential at the surface of the asteroid is minus 40 kilojoules per kilogram. Then the gravitational potential at the surface surface of a planet of radius r is v. What would the gravitational potential at a height of r above the planet's surface be? So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, again, so we've got to remember what our gravitational potential equation is. So the gravitational potential is equal to negative big G big M over the radius of the air object. So therefore we pop it all through. Remember, you're given the radius of the Earth on the, on the equation sheet. It's 6.37 times 10 to the 6 meters. Pop in all the values through and it's negative 6.25 times 10 to the 7 joules per kilogram. The next one, we're going to have to add 650 times 10 to the 3 because we converted kilometers into meters to the air radius of the Earth's surface because we take R from the center of mass of the object. So we've got to add the radius of the planet to the distance above the surface. We then pop in all the values and we get minus 5.67 times 10 to the 7 joules per kilogram. This next one, we've got to remember that here, the, the change in gravitational potential okay, is going to have to be 40 times 10 to the 3 joules per kilogram. Now, work done is equal to mass times by the change in potential. That, again, is another equation which you're given in the um, exam, but you've also got to be able to use. So the mass of the object that's being moved, not the mass of the object making the field. Remember, if it's small m, it's the mass of the object that's moving in the field. So it's 510 times by, uh, by, by 40 times by 10 to the 3. So we get our answer to be 20 times 10 to the 6 joules. The next question is, we know V is directly proportional to 1 over R. We can tell that from the equation V minus G M over R. So if G and M are constant, V is directly proportional to 1 over R. So therefore, if the air height is doubled above the surface, if height is doubled, we can therefore say that it's going to be halved for the potential because they're inversely proportional. The next question says, draw lines to show the shape and direction of the gravitational field of the Earth. Then the gravitational field strength G is uniform close to the Earth's surface. Describe the pattern of the gravitational field lines close to the surface of the Earth. Then the planet Saturn has a mass of 5.7 times 10 to the 6 kilograms and a radius of 6 times 10 to the 7 meters. Calculate the gravitational field strength at Saturn's surface. Then Saturn's second largest moon, Rhea, has an orbital radius of 5.3 times 10 to the 8 meters and a mass of 2.3 times 10 to 21 kilograms. Calculate Rhea's orbital speed, then calculate Rhea's kinetic energy. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so this first one, you've got to be able to understand what a gravitational field looks like for a planet. So you're going to have radial lines coming out of the Earth, indicating they appear to meet at the centre of the Earth. However, they would just stop at the surface of the Earth, but they would appear to actually meet at the centre. And you've got the direct towards the Earth, because the field lines show the direction in which a mass would move. Gravity is always attractive, so the field lines should be going towards the planet or, or the object. Uh, and then this next one, you would notice that if that if it's a uniform field, well, we can tell that gravitational field strength is shown by how close the field lines are together. So if it's a uniform strength, the field lines are staying the same distance apart from each other. So therefore, they're parallel to each other and perpendicular to the surface of the Earth itself. Now, to calculate the gravitational field strength, we'll do G equals big G big M over R squared. Pop in all the values. Remember, it's R squared and we get 11 newtons per kilogram. Now, this next one, we can work out the orbital speed because we can see say that the equation for the orbital speed is v equals the square root of gm over r. Again, that's worked through by looking at the energies okay, of the particular of, of the object. So we can say v is equal to square root two, uh, gm over r. You can pop that all through and you work it out to be 8.5 times 10 to the 3 meters per second. Now, in terms of calculating kinetic energy, we can work out that with our equation. Kinetic energy is a half mv squared. The very famous equation still works in this context. So it's a half mv squared. We've just worked out V before, so therefore it's 8.2 times 10 to 28 joules. 
The next question says, determine the mass of the sun, given that the time of orbit of the Earth is 365 days and the rate of the Earth's orbit is 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. The radius and time of the orbit of Io, one of Jupiter's moons, are 5 times 10 to the 20, it's 5.2, sorry, 4.22 times 10 to the 8 meters in 42 hours respectively. So determine the mass of Jupiter. Then it's estimated that the solar system completes an orbit around the galactic center of the Milky Way in 250 million years with the radius of orbit of 27,000 light years. Determine the effective mass within the orbit that has its center of mass as galactic center. One light year is 9.46 times 10 to the 15 meters. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so for this first one, we've got to use the, the concept you've covered in circular motion because the orbit will be considered to be in a, carry out a circular path. So we can say that the angular velocity is equal to 2 pi over t. So it's the angular change in one a complete revolution, 2 pi radians, divided by the time taken for one complete revolution. That time must be given in seconds. You're going to have to convert uh, the value of one year into seconds because that is how long it takes for the Earth to orbit the sun once. So you get out to be 1.99 times 10 to the minus 7 radians per second. We can then use our equation to work out the mass because we, what we can do is we can link it in with the law of orbits that, that, that comes through. We'll say that mass is equal to r cubed omega squared over g. We can pop in all the values and we get 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. That, though that comes again from Kepler's law of orbits. The next one again is the same principle once again. We can work out the angular velocity by doing 2 pi over t work out our angular velocity in radians per second to be 4.16 times 10 to the minus 5, pop in the values into the equation to work out mass, and we get 1.9 times 10 to the 27 kilograms. And then again, same logic, omega is equal to 2 pi over t, work it all through, and we get 8.3 times 10 to the minus 16 radians per second, where you can work out the mass with our equation r, r cubed omega squared over g, pop in all the values and we get 1.7 times 10 to the 41 kilograms. The next question says, calculate the orbital speed of the Hubble Space Telescope given that it orbits at a height of 547 kilometers above the Earth's surface, and then determine the radius of orbit and the altitude of a GPS satellite which orbits the Earth twice a day. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, in this first one, we've got to be able to work out orbital speed. So we're using our equation, which we talked about before, where v is equal to the square root of gm over r. That's the equation for orbital speed. We can pop in all the values. Now, again, remember that it's the r is the distance we have from the center of the Earth to the actual satellite. So you've got to add the distance above the surface to the radius of the Earth. Once again, it's given to you on the equation sheet. We work out our answer, and then 7.59 times 10 to the 3 meters per second. Now this next one again we've got to work out our angular velocity by doing 2 pi over t. Again we know that it orbits twice a day so therefore we can do 12 times by 3600 for the orbital time because there's 3600 hours in one second and it orbits once every 12 hours so we get our answer to be 1.54 times 10 to the minus 4 radians per second. We can therefore work out r from the equation we looked at before and we can get our r out to be 2.66 times 10 to the 7 meters. So that's the total that's the total separation from the center of mass to the actual satellite. We subtract then the radius of the planet, 6.36, 6.37 times 10 to the 6, to get the actual height above the surface to be 2.02 times 10 to the 7 meters. The next question says, determine the kinetic energy of the SMAP satellite, which has a mass of 1,123 kilograms and orbits the Earth at a height of 685 kilometers. Then determine the kinetic energy of the Earth in its orbit around the Sun. Then determine the escape velocity of an object at the Earth's surface. And then determine the escape velocity of an object at the Moon's surface. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so what you've got to remember is how can you work out the kinetic energy? Well, the, kin the energy is going to be working through because it's actually going to be equal to the change in potential energy. So you can say E is equal to G big M small m over 2R. So we can pop those all in. Now again, we do know that kinetic energy equals a half mv squared, but we don't have enough information to work out V in this particular situation. So we can use G M M over 2R, which is the change in potential energy. Remember R, 
is the distance from the center of the earth to the object so we've got to add the radius of the earth to the height above the surface of the earth to work our answer to be 3.17 times 10 to the 10 joules the next question again we're using that same equation the change in potential is equal to the kinetic energy which is gmm over 2r so therefore we can pop in all the values once again remember we're going to be able to work out if the, if the distance it is to from the earth to the sun which was given before to be 1.50 times 10 to the 11 meters again that's given to you on the equation sheet so it's 2.64 times 10 to the 33 joules the escape velocity now again this is an equation which you'd have to memorize again it comes from the energy transfers that go on the kinetic energy equals potential energy so the escape velocity is going to equal to be the square root of 2 gm over r to over r so as the orbital velocity is square root gm over r the escape velocity is square root 2 gm over r so you pop in all the values that we've got remember r is going to be this the radius of the earth because we're at the surface of the earth we pop in all the values and we get 1.12 times 10 to the 4 meters per second then we can use the same equation to work out the moon's escape velocity by doing square root 2 gm over r popping all the values given to you in the question and we get 2.37 times 10 to the 3 meters per second the next question says calculate the gravitational force of attraction between two objects separated by a distance of one centimeter each having a mass of 100 grams two asteroids separated by a distance of four times 10 to the nine meters and each having a mass of five times 10 to the 10 kilograms a satellite of mass 1.4 times 10 to the four kilograms orbiting the earth at a distance of 6,800 kilometers from the earth's center and then estimate the gravitational force of attraction between two people sitting side by side on a park bench how does this force compare with the gravitational force exerted on each of them by the earth so pause the video now then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer right so this one again we're using newton's law of gravitation so f equals g m m over r squared remember we don't work in centimeters we work in meters okay so you work it through to be 6.67 times 10 to the minus 9 newtons next again we use the gravitational law of attraction so we can then do g m m over r squared pop in all the numbers remember it's r squared and we get 1 times 10 to the minus 8 newtons the next question again we're using g m m over r squared now again remember that we're going to be uh, not working in kilometers we're working in fact in meters so it's 6.8 times 10 to the 6 okay and it's r squared and we get our answer to be 1.2 times 10 to the 5 newtons now it's very important that you can estimate values in a level physics so if people are sitting side by side with each other we say they're about 0.5 meters apart we say they've each got a mass of about 70 kilograms so we can pop that into the equation and we get out about 10 to the minus 6 newtons so a human with a mass of 70 kilograms will have a weight for about 700 newtons because it's mass times by uh, gravitational field strength which is 9.81 so we can say that their weight is greater than the mutual attraction by about a factor of like 10 to the 9 so it, it's very very a much bigger um, idea of weight than it is gravitational attraction the next question says calculate the gravitational force between two uh, pi zero particles in deep space if they are eight meters apart the mass of this pi zero or neutral pion is 2.4 times 10 to the minus 28 kilograms then calculate the gravitational force between the earth and the moon if the moon's mass is 7.35 times 10 to the 22 kilograms the distance from the earth to the moon is 384400 kilometers then calculate the average distance of the earth from the sun if the sun's mass is 2 times 10 to 30 kilograms the gravitational attraction between the earth and the sun is 3.57 times 10 to 22 newtons so pause the video now then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer so again in this question we're going to be using newton's law of gravitation f equals g m m over r squared so you pop in all the values you work it through and we get 6.0 times 10 to the minus 68 newtons this next one again we'll be using that same law of gravitational attraction f is equal to g m m over r squared pop in all the numbers and we get 2 times 10 to the 20 newtons always remember to be squaring the r value in that equation and once again we're now going to work the other way around so we use a newton's law of gravitational attraction but we're now making r the subject so r is equal to the square root of g m m 
so you get GMM divided by M there. So you work it through and you get 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters by working all those values through. So it's square root of GMM over F, my apologies. The next question says, figure 18.14 shows the Earth's gravitational field. Copy the diagram and add arrows to show the direction of the field. Explain why the formula for potential energy gained mg delta h cannot be used to find the increase in potential energy when an aircraft climbs to a height of 10,000 meters but cannot be used to calculate the increase in potential energy when a spacecraft travels from the Earth's surface to a height of 10,000 kilometers. Then Mercury, the smallest of the eight recognized planets, has a diameter of 4.88 times 10 to the 6 meters and a mean density of 5.4 times 10 to the 3 kilograms per meter cubed. Calculate the gravitational field at its surface. Then a man has a weight of 700 newtons on the Earth's surface. What would his weight be on the surface of Mercury? So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so for this first one again, you're going to have arrows directed towards the Earth because the gravitational field goes in the direction that a point mass would move in. Gravity is always attractive, so it points towards the centre of the planet. Now, you can't use the equation E equals mg delta h because for a rise of 10,000 metres, g, the Earth's gravitational field strength, can be considered to be uniform. So we can use that equation, but for a greater change in distance, g will change. So therefore, that equation it cannot be used because g is no longer constant. Now, what's, how can we work through the gravitational field? Well, we know that the mass of Mercury is going to be equal to density times by volume. We know the volume is going to be 4 over 3 pi r cubed because it's a sphere. So we can work out the mass by 3.286 times 10 to 23 kilograms. We know G equals big G big M over r squared. We've just worked out M, so therefore we can work it through to be 3.7 newtons per kilometer, a kilogram. Now the next question is, what would the weight be on the surface of Mercury? Well, we've just worked out what small g would be, 3.7 newtons per kilogram. So weight is mass times by gravity. So it's 700 times by 3.68. So it's 340 newtons. The next question says, what is the gravitational potential and what are its units? What is the significance of the negative sign in the gravitational potential equation? Sketch a graph of gravitational potential against distance for an object in the Earth's gravitational field. What does the gradient of a graph of V against R tell you? And find the gravitational potential at the surface of the Earth. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so definition of gravitational potential is it is the gravitational potential energy that a unit mass would have at that point in the gravitational field and it's measured in joules per kilogram. The significance of the negative sign is that because gravitational fields are inherently attractive. So therefore, we say that at infinity, or when you're out of the field, that the gravitational potential is zero. Now you've got to put energy in to get out of that attractive field. So if you put an energy in to get to zero, well, therefore it must start off at a negative value because work is having to be done to move it out of the field. So the gravitational uh, the gravitational potential distance, sorry, the gravitational potential against distance graph would look something like the following. It's proportional to one over R and it's in a negative. So it'll go through as a curve like so. Now the gradient of V against R, well we know V against R is going to be GM over R over R again, so it's going to be my it's going to be GM over R squared, which we know is the gravitational field strength. So therefore the gradient will be the negative G at that point. And then to work out this gravitational potential, well it's minus GM over R, pop in all the values, we've got the radius of the Earth given to us on the equation sheet. We can pop it through to be minus 6.26 times 10 to the 7 joules per kilogram. The next question says State in words Newton's law of gravitation by considering the centripetal force which acts on a planet in circular motion, show that T squared is directly proportional to R cubed, where T is the time taken for one orbit around the sun, and R is the rate of the orbit. Now the Earth's orbit is of a mean radius 1.50 times 10 to the 11 meters, and the Earth's year is 365 days long. The mean radius of the orbit of Mercury is 5.79 times 10 to the 10 meters, calculate the length of Mercury's year. Then Neptune orbits the 
Sun once every 165 Earth years. Calculate the distance from the Sun to Neptune divided by the distance from the Earth to Neptune. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so in this particular question, you've got to know what the Newton's law of gravitation is. That gravitation is going to be attractive between point masses. It, the, force of the, the force of the attraction is going to be proportional to the product of the two masses, but inversely proportional to the square of the separation of those two masses. Now, in this next question, we know we can link that the centripetal force in this context is the gravitational force of attraction. So the general equation for the gravitational force force is gmm over r squared and the general equation for a centripetal force is m omega squared r and we know t is going to be equal to 2 pi over omega so therefore omega we can then link into uh, is going to be 2 pi over t we can pop all those values into that equation and then we can substitute that down so we can say 4 pi squared over t squared equals gm over r, r cubed we know that 4 pi squared and we know that gm in these contexts are constant constant so therefore tells us that proportionally t squared is directly proportional to r cubed now we can therefore use that to work out the length of the year so if you know t squared is directly proportional to r cubed well we can say that t squared of earth over t squared of uh, mercury is going to it's sorry t squared of earth over r cubed of the earth equals t squared of mercury over r cubed of mercury now we know three out the four of them we know the uh, time of the Earth year. We know the distance between the Earth and the Sun. We know the distance between the Earth and the, between Mercury and the Sun. Now you don't have to convert the time into seconds because it's a ratio. So it would work out a value in days. So it's 87.5 days. Now again, we can use this ratio idea to work out uh, the separation, sorry, the distance between the Earth and Neptune ratio to the distance between Neptune and the Sun. So we can say that uh, the the t squared for the earth over r cubed for the earth is equal to t squared for neptune over r cubed for neptune now we just need to work out r, r cubed for neptune so we can work that out by popping in all the values and um, remember that the earth's orbital time period is one earth year again we don't need to change the uh, units for time because it's a ratio so we work out that the radius of the of neptune to the sun is five point is four point five one times ten to the twelve meters so we can therefore work out that the ratio between the two of them is equal to 30. The next question says, a student believes it's possible for a satellite to be in a geostationary orbit above London. Firstly, explain why a satellite could not be in a geostationary orbit above London. Then the height of a geostationary orbit is 36 times 10 to the 6 metres. Show that the speed of a satellite in a geostationary orbit is about 3 kilometres per second. And then calculate the total energy in joules of a geostationary satellite of mass, six, eight, sorry, of mass 282 kilograms in this orbit. So, pause the video now then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer right so in this first one why can't it be in a geostationary orbit above london well to remain in orbit there must be a force perpendicular to the direction of motion now this satellite could not maintain this orbit without an engine or other force or engine input now you can only really maintain a geostationary orbit when you're in a plane above the equator now in the next one we can work out what r is going to be because it's the distance from the from the surface to the object plus the air radius of the planet which you are given on the equation sheet we can then work out what the time is going to be by working out the time for a um, by 24 times by 60 times by 60 that is going to be the number of seconds in one day and then we'll say v is equal to the um, distance which is going to be 2 pi r from the idea to circular orbit divided by the time so we get 3081 meters per second or three kilometers per second as well now how can we work out our total energy well we know that the total energy for an orbit is the kinetic energy plus the potential energy store we know that the kinetic energy is a half mv squared but in this context it's going to be gmm over 2r when we work it through we know that the potential is going to be equal to negative gmm over r because we can't use mgh so therefore we can work through our value to be minus gmm over 2r pop in all the numbers we know r is the distance from the center of mass not the distance from the surface we can pop in all the numbers and we work it out to be minus 1.3 times 10 to the 9 joules 
The next question says, define the gravitational field strength. And then the table shows in modern units information that was known to physicists at the time of Isaac Newton. Firstly, state the relationship between the gravitational field strength G and the distance R and verify this relationship. Show that the mass of the Earth is about 6 times 10 to 24 kilograms and determine the mean density of the Earth. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so the gravitational field strength we know is the force per unit mass at a point in a gravitational field. That's a definition you've just got to be able to recall. Now, how can you verify a relationship? Well, we know that the relationship should be uh, g is directly proportional to 1 over r squared. So we can therefore say g is equal to k over r squared, where k is just the proportionality constant. Now, if it's a verified relationship, that proportionality constant should be the same for each particular object that you know. So therefore, k will be equal to g r squared. So you do g r squared for each of the values. Now, you don't have to convert units because we're just looking for a same value at this point. So as long as it's in the same units, it should be fine. So you work it through. They are roughly the same number. One is 4 times 10 to the 8. The other is 3.9 times 10 to the 8. So therefore, they're close enough to be correct. Now, for the next question, where we're looking at the mass of the Earth, where we know that g is going to be equal to g m over over r squared so therefore we can work through that it's going to be m is equal to g r squared over g so we can say it's it's going to be 9.81 times by 6.4 times 10 to the 6 squared over 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 so it's 6.024 times 10 to the 24 kilograms then we can work out the mean density because density is going to be mass over volume the earth is a sphere so it's 4 over 3 pi r cubed so you can work it through that way and then you pop in the mass you've just calculated before divided by the volume, which is worked out by 4 over 3 pi r cubed. So you get 5,500 kilometers, uh, sorry, kilograms, meters, meters, per, sorry, kilograms per meter cubed. Now the next question says, state the name given to the satellites that orbit the Earth with a period of one day above the equator. Explain why these satellites orbit above the equator. Then for companies who provide a satellite TV service, suggest the main advantage of using this type of satellite. Now the mass of the Earth is 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms, show that the radius of the orbit of a satellite with an orbital period of one day is about 4 times 10 to the 7 meters, and then state Kepler's third law. And then the Moon orbits the Earth um, with a period of 27.3 days, use the information to calculate the ratio of the distance of the Moon from the Earth's center divided by the distance of the satellite from the Earth's center. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so this is just a fact. We know that it's a geostationary orbit or a synchronous orbit. That's just a fact you've got to learn. Now, they have to be above the equator so they can stay at the same point at all times above the, that part of the Earth, which can only take place if it's, uh, if it's, at, the, um, it's at the equator, because that's the point which will stay stationary to that rotation when you're doing one day. Now, again, the advantage of using geostationary orbits is that the dish can be fixed to just one point in the sky because it's always at that point, so the dish doesn't have to track the satellite as it moves across the sky from the perspective of the Earth, so it's easier for, the, for them to sort that out. Now, the next one we're using this equation of t squared is equal to 4 pi squared over gm r cubed. So, therefore, you can make r cubed the subject, pop in all the values, and remember, you can work it through to get r out, which is 4.2 times 10 to the 7 meters. Now, in the next question, how can we work out what's Kepler's, Kepler's third law? Well, it's that t squared is directly proportional to r cubed, so the cube of a planet's distance from the sun divided by the square of the orbital time period is the same, it's a constant. And we can use that idea of that ratio that the rate that r cubed is equal to t squared or proportional to t squared by looking it through. Now, again, we know um, the time it takes for the earth to orbit orbit the air, the, the, the earth, so the moon to orbit the earth, we know it's 27.3 days. We can then work out how long it takes for the, the earth to orbit again to go around itself once, which is one day. So therefore we can go 27.3 over one. Okay, that's all squared. So you can work through that ratio to be 9.1. The next question says, planets outside our solar system are called exoplanets. An exoplanet of mass 5.69 times 10 to 27 kilograms orbits a star of mass 3.83 times 10 to 30 kilograms. Compare the mass of the star with the mass of the exoplanet in terms of orders of magnitude. And then the distance between the exoplanet and the star is 3.14 times 10 to the 11 meters. Calculate the gravitational force between the star and the exoplanet. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Yeah.
Right, in this first one, what you've got to do is you've just got to divide what you've got to divide the two masses by each other. So it's 3.38 times 10 to 30 over 5.69 times 10 to 27. So that equals 200, so equals 673. So therefore, you can say it's about three orders of magnitude greater when you work it through. So therefore, you can say that's about three orders because it's about ten, it's going to be about ten, it's going to be about 10 to the 3. So 10 to the 30 divided by 10 to the 27 is going to be 10 to the 3. So it's three orders of magnitude greater. We can then use our equation for the Newton's law of gravitational attraction to put in all the values. Remember it's r squared so we get f is equal to 1.47 times 10 to the 25 newtons. The next question says a space vehicle has a mass of 16,800 kilograms as in an orbit 900 kilometers above the surface of the earth. Then we give the mass of the earth, the radius of the earth, so show the orbital speed of a vehicle is approximately 7,400 uh, meters per second. Now the space vehicle moves from the orbit of 900 kilometers above the earth's surface to an orbit 400 kilometers above the earth's surface where the orbital speed is 7,700 meters per second. Calculate the total change that occurs in the energy of the space vehicle. Assume that the vehicle remains outside the atmosphere after the change of orbit and use the value of 7,400 meters per second for the speed in the initial orbit. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so in this first one, we've got to say that the gravitational force of attraction is equal to the centripetal mass. So therefore, we can work that then through to work out what V is. The orbital speed is going to be square root of gm over r. So as a result, we can pop in all the values. Now again, remember, r is from the center of the planet to the objects. We add the radius of the planet in there. So we get it out to be 5.4 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. Sorry, 5.4 times 10 to the 7. So therefore, square root of this 7 is 7,396 meters per second. Now again, in this next one, we know that potential energy is gmm over r, and we also kinetic energy in this case is a half mv squared. So we can work out the change in potential by doing it at 900 kilometers and doing it at 400 kilometers. But again, remember we've got to work a book from the center of mass of the Earth to the actual object. So we've got to work it through from the actual um, center of mass of the object. And that can work out that the potential energy is equal to minus 6.8 times 10 to the 10 joules. Now we then know kinetic energy is a half mv squared. Now we can work it through in terms of what the speed was at the start compared to the speeds at the end by doing your v squared like so. So we get our change in kinetic to be 3.81 times 10 to the 10 joules. We then subtract one from the other to find the change. So therefore we get minus 2.99 times 10 to the 10 joules. The next question says, the NASA space probe Dawn has traveled to and orbited large asteroids in the solar system. Dawn has a mass of 1,240 kilograms. The table gives information about two large asteroids orbited by Dawn. Both asteroids can be considered to be spherical and remote from other large objects. Dawn began orbiting Vesta in a circular orbit at a height of six, 680 kilometers above the surface of the asteroid. The gravitational force acting on Dawn at this altitude was 24.1 newtons. So that the tangential velocity of Dawn in this orbit is 135 meters per second. Calculate the orbital period of Dawn. Then later in its mission, Dawn entered the orbit around Ceres. It then moved from a high orbit to a lower orbit around the asteroid. State what is meant by the gravitational potential of a point in space. Then Dawn has a gravitational potential of minus 1.29 times 10 to the 4 joules per kilogram in the high orbit, and then a gravitational potential of minus 3.22 times 10 to the 4 kilogram, joules per kilogram in the lower orbit. Determine the change in potential energy of Dawn as a result of this change in orbit. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so in this first one, we can then work out what the value of of the, of the uh, tangential or, uh, velocity is going to be, because you know it's a circular orbit, so therefore it's a centripetal force acting on the object. So F equals mv squared over r. We've got all the values except for v. Remember, r is from the center of mass of the planet, so we've got to include the uh, we've got to include the rays of the planet in that. So r works through to be 135 meters per second. The orbital period is going to be v equals to be distance over time, which is 2 pi r over t. Again, we've got r. We know 2 pi. We've just worked out v to be 135. So therefore, t equals 4.39 times 10 to the 4 seconds. 
uh, gravitational potential we know is the work done in moving a unit mass from infinity to that point in the gravitational field that's a fact you've just got to remember and then the change in potential energy is going to be equal to when you're working it through the change in potential which you can work out be minus 1.93 times 10 to the 4 then the work done is the mass times by this change in potential you've got the mass of the thing that's moving which is the actual which is dawn in this case uh, so it's minus 2.39 times 10 to the 7 joules the next Next question said Galileo was the first person to observe, ob observe Jupiter's larger moons. Ganymede is Jupiter's larger, largest moon. The distance between the centre of Ganymede and the centre of Jupiter is 1.07 times 10 to the 6 kilometres. Ganymede takes 171 hours to complete an orbit around Jupiter. Calculate the mass of Jupiter. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so how do you work this through? Well, the first thing is you can work out what the, the orbital time is by doing 171 times by 60 times by 60. So it's 615,600 seconds. We can then use, you can use the idea of the centripetal force is equal to the gravitational uh, force of attraction to then get out an equation for gm equals 4 pi squared r cubed over t squared. That's Kepler's law of orbits. So therefore, we can rearrange that and make m the subject pop in all the values that we've got so we get 1.91 times 10 to the 27 kilograms the next question says makey make is a dwarf planet in the solar system makey make has a mass of 3.1 times 10 to 21 kilograms and a radius of 715 kilometers calculate the gravitational field strength at the surface of make make and then the distance of make make from the sun is similar to the average distance of the dwarf planet pluto from the sun a website states the time taken by make make to complete one orbit of the sun is 20 percent greater than the time taken by pluto to complete one orbit of the sun assess the accuracy of the website statement so pause the video now then unpause the video and you want to go through your answer right so this first one gravitational field strength how do you work that through it's gm over r squared pop in all the numbers you've got the values given to you remember we don't work in in kilometers we work in meters remember to square the value for r and we get 0 0.404 newtons per kilogram now the next question we can work out what the angular speed is going to be by doing angular speed is equal to the square root of gm over r cubed and we can work that through to be 6.5 times 10 to the minus 10 radians per second we can then work out therefore the orbital time by doing t equals 2 pi over omega and therefore we can work it out to be 9.67 times 10 to the 9 seconds which is 307 years so now we've got the time period for make make and we already had the time period for pluto both in years because we're going to ratio them it doesn't make a difference so therefore we can ratio the two of them 307 divided by 248 is 1.24 so the orbital time of make make isn't actually 20 percent greater it's 24 percent greater than that of pluto so it's not as accurate as we'd like it to be so that brings an end to our revision session today. So hopefully, if you've been successful and you've learned in this revision session, you should be able to answer A-level physics examination style questions, assess your understanding on A-level physics, and understand what topics you need to improve upon for A-level physics for the gravitational fields topic. So thank you very much for participating in this revision session for gravitational fields for the AQA physics um, exam board on paper two and on this particular uh, gravitational fields topic. Thanks so much and have a lovely day.